please take it away. It's on? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so thanks uh, for coming. And, um, you know, during this conference, I got a bit inspired to maybe be a bit more bold, kind of go out on a ledge here a little bit more. So I kind of shook things up a couple days ago. And I think perhaps a better um, title for my talk now is What Will We Leave Our Future? So we're all here for the effects of climate change on the world's oceans, and often we're projecting out into the future. A number we see a lot is 2100, right? And so I want us all to reflect on where we will be in 2100. If you're like me, um, <laughs> we're not young enough to be here in 2100, right? So where will humanity be in 2100? Probably there will be some people like us in a room similar to this, um, somewhere else, asking related questions. What these questions will be, where humanity will be, is totally unknown. But we can leave them the keys for future success. And so on Monday, we saw some amazing photographs from Christian Clowers. This isn't one of them. This is just Google. Um, <laughs> it's a lot easier. Um, but we have a global seed, ball, uh, seed vault on Svalbard, right? And so this is forward thinking. Um, this is a, it's a forward way of thinking about our future. And the hallways are filled with gifts for future uh, humans, right? Should they need these gifts? And the hall of gifts I'm going to talk about today look more like this. So these are servers for data storage and maintenance. And these servers hold one of the keys to our future. Right? This is better than gold to future scientists and researchers. So in many ways, we're already familiar with the power of big data. We've seen talks about global analyses throughout the week. Um, and these would not be possible without access to huge amounts of data from many, many different people, very collaborative efforts. So we're familiar with open data and sharing data, but I think we can do a lot better. And so I'm going to give a bit of some examples from personal experience with ecosystem modeling. Um, so end-to-end -end ecosystem modeling, um, you know, you can incorporate everything from physics to fisheries, including ocean biogeochemistry, pollution, socioeconomic interactions, things like that. And these modeling frameworks are incredibly flexible in that you can include lots of different things, and they can become increasingly complex. Right? But this complexity comes at a cost. And that is that these things are incredibly data hungry. Well, fortunately, we've collected data on many different things, right? From phytoplankton up through the trophic level to, to top predators like whales and seabirds, but also fishing, fishery fleets and, and different socioeconomic um, interactions. And these types of data exist on global repositories such as these which are already really amazing resources, and their value is only, to, only going to continue to be increased as we meet our uncertain future. We also have more regional data portals, like, like this one, um, which make local ecosystem-based efforts um, much more approachable and manageable. But almost certainly the ecosystem modeler, or, in, or many modelers, are going to rely on sources of literature to parameterize their models, right? And this, extracting data from this, can, can range anywhere from having direct links to long-term repositories, such as Zenodo, or um, supplemental CSV files, all the way down to um, manually digitizing figures or um, seeing data, upon, uh, data available upon request quotations, which you know, then you have to contact the author and it's a bit more work. And just so, um, you, know, just so you know, <laughs> in my opinion, Sort of the holy grail is up near the top where we, we have things in, in, uh, citable, with citable DOIs and long-term repositories. And I'm giving a thumbs down to this statement here. Um, and why? I'm just going to return to the beginning. Where, where are you going to be in 2100 when somebody wants your data? All right? Set that aside for a second. Where are you going to be in 20 years? Or 10? Or 5? Right? The average length of a tenure track research position is 20 years. And it's much shorter for postdocs and graduate students. So this is totally a, a false claim, right? We, it's a false promise. We can't, 
we can't rely on this for our future. Um, and lastly, uh, you know, we, we all work um, as modelers with field biologists. Right? We get a lot of our data from unpublished and published um, uh, resources and collaborate a lot with field biologists. So it's inherently very collaborative to build big um, models, especially ecosystem models. And so I'm not going to dive too much into the details of my work. Um, my poster was taken down yesterday, so sorry about that. But there's, there's stuff online, um, and you can reach out to me. But just in brief, right, we use a lot of different sources of data, a lot of different local surveys, sources of literature, diet databases, and other publicly available fishing information. And so I can't overstate how collaborative these efforts are and how grateful I am for all of the collaborators and how willing they've been to share data with me. So what I'm about to say is no reflection on any individuals or institutions, but I'm, I'm trying to think of ways that we can all be a little bit more efficient together. So I went through and tried to quantify, you know, how hard was it for me to get data sets, you know, from collaborators and things like this, right? So I just counted the number of days it took from sending that initial email to finally receiving a sort of polished uh, version of the data. And then I, I counted the number of emails sent by all parties. Um, and so these are the, I should no note that these are the major data sets. It's not entirely everything. And then these are the number of the hours of meetings, which, you know, those always included different numbers of people. So the actual human hours here is, um, you know, not, not listed. And so the point here is to just highlight that there are some inefficiencies. <laughs> that wasn't intended to be funny, but <laughs> you'll note that the, the top two took almost a year to get, right? Um, the third one down the list had over a decade of data missing from what I finally got because it was in a different format. The metadata were sort of unsure. There had been turnover in positions. And so there was over a decade of taxpayer-funded data that was just sort of, you know, lost in the ether. Um, these bottom two, in contrast, have lots of metadata published. They have their, um, their data in available online immediately. And one of these even has an R package where you can write a couple of lines of code, download data immediately into R, and you're ready to go. Um, and so I do want to caveat here that you know, emails and hours of meetings aren't a bad thing, right? There's a lot in a data set, and there's a lot to clarify, and a lot of caveats and things like that. So not inherently bad, but I think we can do a bit better. And so if we think our data collection efforts are important beyond what we initially intended to collect these data for, um, and if we think ecosystem-based fisheries management is important, we need to make our data available. And this call for open science has come from the top down, in the, at least in the US as well. So almost 10 years ago now, um, the White House released an executive order to make all federal research um, publicly available. And NOAA responded pretty quickly um, with, with our plan for increasing public access to research. And the good news is that our compliance with this has increased each year. Um, the bad news is we're still a little behind other government agencies. And and I think this might be um, more of a systemic issue, perhaps, in our field, right? So this is speculation, but I just question that. And so why don't we share data? This is a survey of over 2,600 researchers in the biological sciences, so it's a bit broader than just fisheries and oceans. And one of the biggest reasons was that people were unsure about how to organize their data in a presentable and useful way, right? That's understandable. But what I'd say there is, you know, the, the future is going to want something, right? And so if that's messy and disorganized, that's better than nothing, right? We can start somewhere. Um, and I think this is probably related to a lack of time, right? It's not, it doesn't actually take that much time to upload data. It's more to organize it and present it and, and get orchestrated. And this is totally understandable. And we need to realize that field biologists can't do everything, right? At the institutional level, we need to start thinking about how do we allocate resources and actually put people, hours, and, and budgets towards organizing data and sort of preparing for the future. Some of these other ones are a little bit more straightforward even, so not knowing which repository to use, just pick one, right? <laughs> there are many. 
I talked about some of them before, and uh, the next slide will show some more. And the costs of sharing data, depending on your field, are relatively low, right? Some, some, I'm not, you know, an ocean system modeler, so, you know, that's a, maybe a different story. Um, and so there are many, many data repositories. I showed some earlier, as I, as I mentioned, but these are, these are some other ones that are very generic. So the Center for Open Science, OSF, and Zenodo are entirely free, um, you know, up to a, a pretty big maximum. Um, GitHub is not a long-term data re repository, so you shouldn't use that as such, but it links directly with Zenodo, right? So it's very straightforward. Dryads, Dryad has a, a small cost, some journals cover it, um, but, but repositories are out there. And I just want to highlight that there are career advantages, there are incentives for this. So people have studied this in different fields, and there's anywhere from a 25% to 70% increase in citation rate if you link your paper to your data, just with one of these repositories. And you can take this a step further. Um, you can actually publish data papers, right? So you can lay out all the caveats of your data set. You can describe your data set, publish this all in a data paper. Some of these, you know, we all have careers and these things are important. Some of these have really high impact factors. And this allows a way um, to sort of shift the, the distribution in, in favor of some field biologists, right? A lot of field biologists don't get credit for their work because analysts are the ones publishing papers, and if we all have the same metrics for promotion and things like that, um, then you know, we're not really creating a fair system. So this is one solution to kind of get around that, and we've actually seen a really great example of this just a couple of days ago. Um, so, so people are using these uh, data, data publications to sort of highlight data sets for broader use. And so with this said, I understand that there are a lot of other reasons people are hesitant or reluctant to share data and code. Um, this is a, a, a paper that I led, that we published last year, and so this is, this is highlighting um, 12 reasons we think people don't want to share data and code, and just some counter arguments and some solutions are outlined there, so I encourage you to check that out. The smiley faces are actually the use of the Whova app poll, where you can ask people coming to your presentation, you know, so I, I ask people, you know, what are, what are the barriers for you sharing your data and code? And I was able to put everybody into one of these boxes, which made me happy. It made me think we didn't miss, miss a category, although we probably did. Just a quick plug for the Society for Open, Reliable, and Transparent Ecology and Evolution. That previous paper came out of a workshop at one of their conferences. They're all virtual, um, free to join, and they don't really care what field you're in. They're just here to help us adopt open science practices. So I encourage you to check that out. And so I'm, I'm going to end with these two doors, um, because we're in Europe, and if you're from the States, uh, you don't see doors like this. <laughs> we have different paths we can take, right? We have a choice. And we can, we can go about business as usual, and that might look something like this, where we have this sea of papers going into the expanding, ever expanding into the future, where we have to sort of sort through and, and look for data and, and find that those people don't exist anymore and perhaps do some web, some scraping of you know, plots. Or we can prepare for a brighter future where we can get organized, put all of our data online, make them openly accessible and available um, for long-term use. So the choice is ours. And with that, I have a lot of people to thank from the ecosystem modeling side, the open science side, um, some, some funders for getting me here to this conference, all the conference um, uh, the sponsors and um, the organizers and the beautiful city of Bergen. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.